I'm going to give a quick overview. Specifically, we'll first see different ways of using your favorite hardware, such as Arduino or Raspberry Pi with MATLAB and Simulink. Next, I'll point you to resources on the Element 14 community that can help you get started. And finally, we'll cover a short hands-on introduction to MATLAB, since that's the tool we are going to show in today's demo. There are two primary ways of using MATLAB and Simulink with low-cost hardware, such as Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and so on. So here's your computer with a MATLAB algorithm or a Simulink model. You'll need to add a support package for the specific hardware platform. And if you have MATLAB support package, you can write MATLAB programs that read and write data to your hardware. Because MATLAB is a high-level interpreted language, programming with it is easier than with C++ or C and other compiled languages. You can see the results from the I.O. instructions immediately, so you don't need to compile anything. Also, MATLAB includes thousands of built-in math and engineering plotting functions that you can use quickly to analyze and visualize the data you've collected. You'll see this in action in today's demo. The other approach uses the Simulink support package. So basically, you create a model in Simulink, you simulate it, you'll tune the algorithm parameters until you get them right, and then download the completed algorithm for a standalone execution on your device. The key thing here is you can interactively tune and optimize your parameters before you run, the, run it on the hardware. The other key point is the automatic code generation capabilities that allow you to go from a graphical representation of your system to the hardware device itself. So today's demo covers this use case with Raspberry Pi and Simulink support package. Now that you understand two basic ways of connecting hardware with MATLAB and Simulink, let's look at some resources available on Element 14 to get you started. So here I am on Element 14 community website. All I'm going to do is look for MATLAB and Simulink in the search window and look for some results. The featured results show MATLAB student suite, and this is where you're going to find all the resources that you need to get started. So as you can see, it provides a little bit of introduction to what MATLAB and Simulink student suite is. Um, it basically includes MATLAB, Simulink, and 10 popular add-ons for various applications, such as signal processing, um, image processing, instrument control, and so on and so forth. Then it provides you various options depending on your, um, your use case for buying the different licenses, and it also provides different bundles. So, for example, you could buy Raspberry Pi, starter kit, which includes popular accessories, along with MATLAB and Simulink student suite to make interesting projects. It also points you to various introductory videos and the Element 14 community for MATLAB and Simulink. This includes pointers to support packages, different tutorials, and also included here are different webinars that have happened in the past, so you can review that content and get started with hands-on demonstrations. So that covers with the resources that are available on Element 14 uh, community website. Now let's start with the hands-on demo of MATLAB to give you a flavor for the tool. So this is MATLAB. You have a command window for entering various commands, which is this window right here. You can create and mod modify variables here that once you create, they can be seen in the workspace window right here. So for example, I could create a variable called A equals one. So that creates a variable A, as you can see it here. Um, I could say B equals two, and then C equals cosine of B, and so on and so forth. So you could create and modify variables as, as you want. Remember that MATLAB is an array-based language where variables can be vectors, matrices, or n-dimensional arrays. For example, to create an array, I could type something like d equals 
square bracket and then use comma to separate the various elements of the matrix. So maybe I could create an array with um, one through five. And that's, that's how that's created. To make it easy to create uniformly spaced arrays, you could use the colon operator. So for example, I could create a variable called x starting from zero, facing of point one, uh, going up to five, or let's say 10. So this shows you it just created a vector x. You can see the size of the vector, um, one by 101. Um, you can use the function such as sine to create another variable like y equals sine of x. And you could suppress the output of uh, this function by using a semicolon so you don't get um, your command window uh, full of numbers. So you can also plot easily um, any variable. So let's say we want to plot y. So there you just created a plot of the variable y. And this interactive nature of MATLAB with a wealth of functions available for analysis makes it easier than a low-level programming languages like C. Now, let's say we want to browse various functions that are available. Let's say I want to create a variable r, and I'm, I want to browse different functions available in MATLAB. You could create on this function icon right here and look at the different functions available on various categories. It also includes all the add-ons um, that come with student suite that are listed here. So let's go to MATLAB under mathematics and let's say we want to create a random number. So let's start with rand, right? So I double click on it, it adds the function here. And let's say um, I start using the function open parentheses and if I pause here, um, it will tell me you know, different ways to provide input arguments to the function. So let's say I want to create a two by two uh, matrix of random numbers. Um, I can provide, um, looks like I can provide size as an um, argument. So I provide two by two and that's what I get. So this is just an example where we created a random number matrix, but you can go to another category and pick function um, and, and learn that way. Finally, there are two, re two other resources I'm going to point to. One is getting started. You can click here for various demos and examples, including videos that help you get started with MATLAB. And the second, and the second resource is, of course, documentation. If you click on the question mark icon here, it's going to launch the documentation browser, and the documentation browser has detailed documentation on each of the products that you have installed, including any hardware support packages. Finally, to add your favorite hardware support package, you can click on add-ons and get hardware support packages and use install from internet as the next step and pick from many, many available hardware pa support packages listed here. So that concludes the overview for today's webinar. I will now pass the control over to Eric Wedgen, who has an exciting demo to share. Thanks, Anuja. In this section of the webinar, we will show how ThinkSpeak, an Internet of Things data collection platform, can be used to collect, analyze, and act on data sent from devices such as Raspberry Pis and Arduinos. To illustrate this, we built a car counter overlooking a busy highway using a Raspberry Pi 2 and a webcam. We use Simulink to deploy the car counting algorithm on the Raspberry Pi, which we connected to ThingSpeak. We then analyze traffic offline with MATLAB or online using ThingSpeak and its built-in MATLAB analysis and MATLAB visualizations apps. Okay, an overview of this section of the webinar. First, I'd like to start out with an introduction to Internet of Things and ThingSpeak, and then we'll go on an interactive tour of ThingSpeak web service using a weather station as an example. So this is a weather station that we built here that sends, uh, sends data every minute to ThingSpeak. Next, we'll talk about how uh, different methods of getting data into ThingSpeak, and then we'll get into the car counter project where we built 
a car counter with a Raspberry Pi 2 and a webcam, and we use Simulink to deploy that, the car counting algorithm on the Raspberry Pi. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can use MATLAB on your desktop to analyze data that you've collected on ThinkSpeak. Okay, what is the Internet of Things? It's a very popular term these days. The Internet of Things describes an emerging trend where a large number of embedded devices, the things, are connected to the Internet. These connected devices communicate with people and other things and often provide sensor data to cloud storage and cloud computing resources where the data is processed and analyzed to gain important insights. One way to describe the Internet of Things is through the diagram you see here. On the left side of the diagram, we, call, we have what we call the edge nodes. So these are the devices and things um, that have the sensors connected to them that are measuring something from the outside world. So they could be measuring temperature, humidity, or a variety of different um, parameters. Then that data gets sent to a data aggregator in the cloud, and that's the middle section of, of the diagram. And then on the far right part of the diagram, we have what we call the exploratory analysis part of the workflow. And the person who sits on the right side of the diagram is typically designing algorithms that will either live on the edge nodes, on the sensor devices themselves, or be deployed back to the cloud. So the algorithm will, will run on the cloud and will take input from all the devices that may be collected in, in the cloud layer to do something uh, useful. So that's the view that we have of the Internet of Things. So now where does ThinkSpeak play? So ThinkSpeak is a free online data aggregation platform that sits in the cloud. It's typically used to collect data from sensors. Those would be the things. And it provides instant visualizations of the data, and it's popular for people experimenting in IoT. It can also be used to act on the data. So not only can you uh, collect the data, but you can act on, on the data. For example, you could send a tweet, and I'll show an example of how to do that uh, shortly. And, and lastly, uh, ThinkSpeak can be used to analyze data. With its built-in MATLAB integration, users can run scheduled MATLAB code on data as it comes into ThingSpeak. So basically there are three main parts of ThingSpeak, the ability to collect, analyze, and act on data. Okay, before we jump into ThingSpeak, let's talk about our reference example. So on the garage next to our building, we've built a weather station that uses an Arduino and an Arduino weather shield. So this weather station, you can see a picture of it here in the center of the diagram, has a rain gauge, it has a anemometer, and it can, so it can detect barometric pressure, temperature, humidity, and a number of other parameters. And the way this is built is we have the Arduino and its weather shield uh, connected to a Zigbee uh, transmitter that transmits into our building where we have another Arduino that picks up the signal and then that Arduino is connected to the internet. And all of this is connected to the cloud, uh, to, to the ThingSpeak platform in the cloud. So once the data gets into our building, it's sent up to, to ThingSpeak. And then, of course, you can use MATLAB to analyze the data, and that's shown in the right side here. And at this point, I'd like to go into ThingSpeak and show you the data that's being collected by that weather station. Okay, let's jump into ThingSpeak. When you arrive in ThinkSpeak, what you will see is uh, this home page here. Um, you'll see that data is actually organized by channels in ThinkSpeak. So I'm going to click on channels, and I'm going to click on watch channels. So these are channels that I have decided I wanted to keep an eye on, and I've selected them to watch. Uh, the weather station happens to be one of those. So our weather station here is channel 12397. So if I click on that, uh, the data is now loading up for the weather station. So you can see some basic information about the weather station. It's located here in the Boston area. Um, the first field of data shows the wind direction. So that's the wind direction in degrees, where north is zero degrees. So you can see it's the wind direction. Um, and you can see the very last point that we've received here. So each uh, point is time stamped as it comes into ThingSpeak. And if we scroll down, um, we also see that the wind speed is being monitored. This particular weather station, the way we set it up, is it's sending data to ThingSpeak once every minute, and there's eight different sensors that are reporting. Uh, field three shows the humidity. So you see the humidity um, is approximately 80% right now. And then if I scan down further, I can see the temperature uh, plot for the last uh, 12 hours or so. And I'm also keeping track of rainfall. We haven't had any rainfall in the last uh, 24 hours. And then uh, I see pressure. And finally, some statistics about the uh, power level that the weather station is seeing. Uh, 
This is basically the electrical current that's coming into the weather station, as well as the light intensity um, that's getting into the box. So that's the raw data that we uh, can see when we look at the weather station. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could do more with this data uh, rather than just looking at the raw data? ThinkSpeak allows you to do a lot more with the data. So what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at the apps that ThinkSpeak provides. So if you look here, there are a number of apps, and we're going to start uh, looking at the MATLAB Visualizations app. So I'm going to click on the MATLAB Visualizations app, and I'm going to create a new MATLAB Visualization clicking by clicking New. So you'll see here there are a number of templates and examples, and many of these examples do use uh, our weather station, which is running 24 hours a day, continuously sending data to ThinkSpeak. I'm going to show you a MATLAB visualization uh, for the wind speed. So you remember we saw the raw wind speed and direction, but let's see if we can get a little more insight into that data. And I'm going to choose that example. It says plot wind velocity over the last hour using the compass plot. So I'm going to create this particular visualization. And you'll see that brings up a code window box where all of the MATLAB code needed for, for me to uh, create this visualization is included and comments are also included. So the channel I'm reading from is 12397, the wind field ID is, is 1, and the wind speed ID is 2, which means that it's field 1 and field 2 of the data that's being sent into ThinkSpeak. And then um, there's commands for actually reading the data from ThinkSpeak. That's the ThinkSpeak read command you see here. And then the commands on the bottom are the actual visualization where we use the compass command in MATLAB. Now, if I scroll down, I can actually run and save this particular visualization. So now MATLAB is running. This is the MATLAB that's connected to ThinkSpeak in the cloud. And if I scan down, I can see a plot of the wind direction and velocity over the past hour. And you can see it's currently blowing from uh, this direction uh, here, which is about 330 or 320 degrees. 320 degrees is, a, is approximately northwest. Okay, so what else can we do? So we've done a nice visualization of the wind direction. Let's go back to the apps, and now let's look at the MATLAB analysis app. So if I look like the Mat at the MATLAB analysis app, I'm going to uh, create a analysis now where I calculate something that my weather station can't do. So my weather station reports temperature and humidity, but it can't report the dew point. But there is a formula that we can use to calculate dew point from temperature and humidity. So I'm going to grab this uh, calculate dew point now analysis uh, that is based on an example that's built into ThinkSpeak. So again, you see it looks very similar to the, the start of this, looks very similar to the code we were looking at before, except we're now looking at different fields, the same channel. We're, we're reading from the same channel. Uh, we're looking at humidity and temperature because we need those quantities in order to calculate the dew point. And then as I scan down, you can see that I'm, I will be reading the data into, into uh, reading the data from the temperature field and the humidity field using that, the commands here. Temp F equals things speak read and humidity equals things speak read. And then here I do some calculations to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then this is the actual calculation of the dew point. The formula has been coded up here. And then finally, I'm going to display uh, the dew point, and then I'm going to write it to another channel. So one of the neat features of ThinkSpeak is you can calculate a result, but you can actually save that result and store it in another channel so that it's there for your later use. So what I will do is I will run and save that right now and scroll down to the bottom and you'll see here that the dew point is currently 65.591 degrees. Okay, but I mentioned that I was writing this to another channel. So let's go back to my channels and look at my channels. And I'm going to go to my dew point channel and there you can see that the point that I just re, uh, recorded there has been written. So anytime that I run this particular script, then I will get the value written to this particular channel. But there's some more interesting things I can do if I go back and look at the analysis that we were just uh, creating. So I'm going to go back into the, to the analysis of calculating the dew point here. And Rather than running and, and, and saving it as I just did, I'm going to look at the bottom here and show you some other options. There's something called a time control. So if I wanted the dew point to be continuously calculated every time a data point came in to ThinkSpeak, um, what I could do is I could use a time control. So I grab the time control and 
I could then uh, set up the time control with a certain frequency, so I wanted to make this recurring. And say I wanted to do this uh, every hour, I wanted to record a data point. I record it every hour, and I can start any time I want. Say I want to start at 7 o'clock tonight, I can set it for 7 o'clock in the evening, and then I can choose what I want to do. Well, I do want it to do a MATLAB analysis, and the type of analysis I want to do is calculate the dew point. So when I do this, it, is, it, is, it will save, if I save this time control, what will happen is every time a data point comes in from the, the weather station, I will now have a data point created for a dew point that is saved and can be accessed um, from, from ThingSpeak. Okay, but what if I want to take an action when something happens on, on my channel? Well, there's another app called uh, React that will allow us to, to do that. I'm going to go to the React app that's part of ThingSpeak, and I'm going to go to the React for Dew Point. So this is the React that I've already created, but I'll show you uh, how it works. So this React app uh, basically looks at the data coming in on my Dew Point channel, and every time a data point comes in, it checks to see if the Dew Point is less than 32 uh, degrees. And then I can take a number of actions. Um, I can do another MATLAB analysis. I can do something called ThingTweet, and that's what I'm going to show you. So ThingTweet allows me to link my uh, Twitter account and then send a message when this particular condition is met. So if it's 32 degrees, my Twitter account will send me a message saying it might be a frosty night. So remember, we have the dew point set up to be sending a value uh, once an hour. Uh, we're getting a dew point value from the weather station, and then this is also monitoring that dew point channel to see if that dew point temperature is close to 32 degrees. So you can clearly see there's a lot you can do with your data once it's in ThingSpeak. Okay, let's jump back into the presentation. So how do you get data into ThingSpeak? Well, there are a number of ways to get data into ThingSpeak. ThingSpeak comes with a REST API, so that's any where you can send a signal uh, with a, over the REST API, you can use ThingSpeak to get the data data in. There's also native libraries for Particle and Arduino. You can find those on GitHub. And then there are Simulink support packages for Raspberry Pi, Arduino, and BeagleBone Black. So these are packages that uh, MathWorks provides that allows you to, that provide blocks that allow you to send data directly to ThingSpeak. And in our next demonstration, we're going to actually show how you can use the Raspberry Pi Simulink blocks to send data to ThingSpeak. Okay, so how do we build a car counter with a Raspberry Pi, a webcam, and Simulink? So that's what we're going to show in this uh, next part of the presentation. Our basic setup is shown here. So again, in this case, our edge node is the camera that's um, looking out on the busy highway. Again, we're using ThingSpeak at the cloud layer to collect the data. And then in the lower right-hand corner, this time we're using Simulink to design an algorithm. Uh, that's the algorithm that will count the cars that will be deployed to run on uh, a Raspberry Pi 2. Okay, uh, let's take a look at our setup. I have a short video here which will show you the view of the camera outside the fourth floor of our building here. Let me play that. So you can see here, it's a fairly busy highway, although at the time of this recording, not, not too much traffic. There's a few cars going in each direction. Um, right here, you'll see um, we have a high-definition camera, USB camera, on a tripod mounted next to the window, and it's connected to the USB port of the Raspberry Pi 2, and then there's an Ethernet cable that connects to our internal um, Ethernet. Um, so it's a fairly simple setup, and uh, that's the view that you see from our camera. Okay, so how do we build the car counting algorithm? So we're using Simulink to build the car counting algorithm. This is what the algorithm looks like. I'm going to jump into Simulink to show you a little more about how this works. So let's jump over to Simulink. And here you will see the car counting algorithm uh, as it appears in the Simulink environment. Okay. So let's take a careful look at the algorithm. If we start at the left side of the diagram, we see the Raspberry Pi video capture block. This block is part of the Simulink support package for Raspberry Pi hardware. This block brings in the data from the USB webcam attached to our Raspberry Pi 2. We then pass the image data into a foreground detector. This block outputs a mask that shows the elements that are changing from frame to frame, 
In other words, it ignores the fixed background data. We now use the median filter to filter out noise in the image. So at this point, then, we've finished the pre-processing and are getting ready for the fun part of the algorithm. The blob analysis block, this is where all the heavy lifting happens. Um, in the blob analysis block, we find the locations of blobs in the image and then draw a bounding box around them. We configure the parameters in this block to look for objects the size of cars. Once we have detected the blobs, the car counter block over here counts the cars. In the very last block, the data is sent to ThinkSpeak. Now ThinkSpeak is receiving a value for the number of cars on the highway uh, every time the model runs. Once we are convinced that the algorithm is working correctly, we can use Simulink to deploy the model onto the Raspberry Pi hardware. Once we've done that, then we can disconnect Simulink and it will run uh, without being connected to Simulink and it will continuously send data to ThinkSpeak. Okay, but you may ask, how do we verify that this algorithm was working? Well, let me jump back into the presentation and I'll show you a video of what we did uh, when we ran Simulink to develop this algorithm. To verify an algorithm in Simulink, one of the things we can do is we can use Simulink in external mode and look at the video display block. So I've taken a recording of this, so I can't do this uh, live because uh, the sensor is currently in its deployed mode and sending data. But when we did uh, originally make deploy the algorithm, we did have to, uh, to verify the algorithm. So let me show you what that looks like. So this is a, a short clip, maybe 25, 30 seconds, showing uh, the cars that are basically detected by the algorithm that was created in Simulink. So you can see it's doing a pretty good job of finding cars on both directions of the highway. And you'll notice on the left uh, side of the diagram, I've also shown you the output of the foreground mask and the filtered foreground mask. So uh, you, if you recall, when, when we opened up the Simulink diagram, there was a foreground mask, and the foreground mask uh, basically is showing you only the things that are not changing. So if you look over here, you see uh, several cars in the still image that are not part of the background. And you also see some noise. And then not one of the other blocks in the Simulink diagram was designed for filtering out that noise. That's the median filter. So when you filter out that noise, then you get the picture on the bottom here, the, which shows uh, four clear, clear blobs. Uh, so that's the, basically how the algorithm is, is working. Uh, when you're looking at the, the various p different parts of the model. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is go back into ThinkSpeak and let's see what the data looks like in, in ThinkSpeak. So this is the car counter channel. So you can see here, car counting uh, in live video. You can see the number of cars um, that have passed uh, a reference line in the last 15 seconds, and we're computing both the eastbound, uh, and you can also see the westbound traffic in red. There we go. So that's the westbound traffic. So indeed, we are actually now getting just one number for the cars, so no images are being sent to ThingSpeak, just the number reported by the algorithm that we've deployed to the Raspberry Pi. Now that we have all the data in ThingSpeak, we can use MATLAB to bring that data back in and do further analysis on the data. At this point, I'm going to go into uh, MATLAB and show you a script that I've written uh, that we can use to do some additional analysis on the data. Okay, so the first thing that we would normally uh, want to do when we're uh, analyzing data coming from this car counter would be to probably to plot the data. So. Let me show you um, where in the script we are plotting the data. So this script, uh, what I've done is uh, I've written a script that will take one week's worth of data and then plot it. So what we do here is we use the ThingSpeak read command. So this is part of the ThingSpeak support toolbox, which you can download on file exchange. That's the channel ID, 38629, where the car counter's data is being sent. And then we're pulling roughly the last week in July, data from the last week in July, into ThingSpeak and then plot that raw traffic data in this, uh, in this uh, segment here uh, of code here. And you can see that's uh, a few lines of code, and that will actually plot the data. So when I run that, that will generate this plot.
You see traffic volume for the week of July 25th, and we're showing both westbound traffic and eastbound traffic. So um, clearly now we can, we can already get some insight into the data. So if you look at each day here, um, you can see that there's roughly two spikes, um, a spike here, a spike there, um, two spikes um, pretty much each day. Um, that has to do with uh, the rush hour in the morning and the evening. And then there's a dip uh, around lunchtime, and then at nighttime, uh, when there's very little traffic on the road, we see these troughs in the data. So immediately we get some quick information by just doing a plot of, of a week's worth of data that's been collected by our, our car counter. So what if we wanted to uh, learn a little bit more about the distribution of the traffic? Well, we could then do something like a histogram. So if we go to the next section of code here, looking at the traffic volume as a histogram, we can use the histogram function in MATLAB. Let's, in this case, we're just going to look at the eastbound traffic, and we're going to see, look at the frequency of observations over one week. So let me show you um, what that particular plot looks like. So eastbound traffic volume over the week, you can see um, there is a daily variation. It looked like there was very heavy traffic here on uh, July 25th. We we're looking at close to uh, 70,000 uh, cars coming by each day. So again, we use MATLAB to sum up you know, the car count uh, for, each, for each day uh, before we ran the histogram function. And then you can see it looks like the, the lowest traffic volume happened to be on July 29th here, where it was closer to 40,000. Okay, well, what if we wanted to get into even more detail? What if we wanted to look at a particular day and we wanted to find the peaks in the traffic? We wanted to know what time of day uh, the traffic was peaking at. Well, MATLAB provides a way to do that and has some, some good functions that let you do that. So I'm going to scan down to the section of code uh, that does that. Um, the timestamp is uh, being imported here. We're importing the timestamp, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take one day's worth of data, and we're going to use what's called the find peaks uh, function. And the find peaks function uh, will actually find peaks for that particular day. So right here is the find peaks function, um, and it will uh, allow us to find those peaks. So when I run that function, uh, it will result in the following plot. And here, now we see the peak volume on this particular day, July 27th. We see MATLAB has identified some peaks in the morning rush, some peaks in the evening rush, and uh, a few other uh, uh, peaks during the day. And you can actually get the actual times of those peaks. So with a few uh, lines of code, we're able to get very good insight into our data. OK, let's jump back into the presentation for some con concluding remarks. Okay, we just demonstrated how we can analyze data uh, from, from ThinkSpeak using the ThinkSpeak support toolbox. So the, the benefits of using MATLAB, Simulink, and ThinkSpeak, there are four clear benefits. You can develop your edge node analytics using Simulink and deploy, uh, deploy them onto your hardware. Um, you can use MATLAB for both offline and online uh, analysis and visualization. So we showed you both visualizations inside of ThinkSpeak and analysis that you can run inside of ThinkSpeak, as well as being able to pull that data into your desktop MATLAB session and do uh, analysis of the historical data. And then finally, scheduled online analyses. So that's how the demonstration that we showed where we were calculating the dew point on a regular schedule and MATLAB was doing that. So even if you uh, walked away from your computer and, and logged off MATLAB you know, on the cloud, uh, the ThinkSpeak uh, and MATLAB connected to it would continue to compute that result. So those are scheduled online analyses. So those are some of the things that you can do with MATLAB, uh, Simulink, and ThinkSpeak. Thanks for listening to today's webinar. For the latest information about new ThinkSpeak features and projects, visit the ThinkSpeak blog at community.thinkspeak.com. To download the ThinkSpeak support toolbox or Raspberry Pi support package used in this webinar, visit MATLAB Central at mathworks.com slash MATLAB Central. And finally, for some full-length articles that use ThinkSpeak and MATLAB along with Raspberry Pi and Arduino hardware, check out MakerZone at makerzone.mathworks.com. This concludes the webinar. There will be a short pause, and the Q&A session will follow in just a moment.
Okay, looks like we have a couple of questions coming in about ThingSpeak. So the first question, do I need a license of MATLAB to use ThingSpeak? Um, no, you don't. You just need to sign up um, at the ThingSpeak.com website. Uh, the next question about ThingSpeak, how fast can I send data to ThingSpeak? Uh, ThingSpeak accepts data at a maximum rate of once every 15 seconds. Um, okay, next question. Uh, this one is about the uh, car counting algorithm. How do I get the vision blocks that you used in the car counting algorithm? Uh, the vision blocks are part of the computer vision system toolbox. Um, next question. What kind of USB webcam did you use in the car counter project? Um, in this car counter project, we used a Logitech HD Pro C920 webcam. Um, okay, another question about the weather station example. For the weather station example, why did you use an XB radio? Um, okay, so that's, that's a good question. The, the station was mounted in a location where there was no strong Wi-Fi signal, so we used an XB shield to send the data from the garage to another Arduino inside the building. The second Arduino had an XB receiver and an Ethernet shield. This Arduino inside the building was connected to the Internet and then the data was passed on to ThinkSpeak. So we wouldn't have needed that if uh, the Wi-Fi signal was strong on the, at the garage. Um, okay, uh, if I already have data stored in ThinkSpeak, what do I need to analyze the data with MATLAB running on my desktop? Okay, so the answer there would be, if you have a licensed copy of MATLAB running on your desktop computer, you would need to download the ThinkSpeak support uh, toolbox. Uh, it's freely available on the file exchange section of MATLAB Central. Once you install the ThingSpeak support toolbox, you'll get access to the ThingSpeak read and ThingSpeak write functions that were used in today's examples. Okay, looks like one more question. Um, I'm using a Raspberry Pi. What kind of sensor data can I access from MATLAB? Um, with the, uh, so from MATLAB, uh, the answer there would be with the MATLAB support package for Raspberry Pi hardware, you can access image data from the camera board, and you can access sensor data from any uh, digital sensor that communicates over I squared C or SPI. Uh, examples include accelerometers, temperature and humidity sensors, and pressure sensors. Okay, well, if anyone has any further questions, they can uh, ask it in the comment section of the event page in which you register for this webinar. I want to take some time to say thank you to our presenters uh, for a great presentation, and for those of you who were able to attend the live session, um, thank you for attending as well. Now, we will have a recording of this presentation available on the Element14.com 14, uh, Element 14 community uh, in the coming hours, so uh, we should have that up later today and uh, look forward to hearing any questions we have uh, moving forward on the event page. So uh, thank you very much, and have a great rest of your day.